Hi, well, I think we may be finishing up the book of Genesis, and I know you think, well, how can that be? Because we've been kind of slowly plodding along through the uh, book, and uh, in my promise to do an overview of the Bible over some period of uh, months or years in the coming uh, seasons, it seems like we've uh, kind of plodded along, and, and that was intentional because there's so many, as I've repeated uh, in the past, so many foundational issues in the book of Genesis. The um, creation, the ideal, the fall of man, the way that uh, God has repeatedly offered uh, mercy and forgiveness and patience and grace, and yet there continues to be so many cases of rebellion. And the um, culmination of the God's dealing with human history in the book of Genesis is really, I should say, the peak, not the culmination. The, the peak of God dealing with humans is, uh, after Noah, is Abraham, choosing Abraham to be the father of many nations, the beginning of the line of uh, God's own nation, and again, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, was uh, purposed in order to give an example and attraction to how people should live and uh, how to uh, discover and worship and be loyal to uh, the one true God. Now, Israel failed in that in many ways, of course, and has still, as a nation or as a race, uh, failed to recognize the Messiah, and yet God still has a plan for that people, and already through that people has blessed the nations. And we see frequently not only allusions to that in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, where it is intended that the gospel be spread throughout all the world from uh, where we are to the farthest reaches. And so the nations have been truly blessed through the lineage from Abraham and down to Jesus, the Messiah. So Abraham was very important, and as I pointed out, um, the better part of, uh, of uh, Genesis is really devoted to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Those are the patriarchs uh, that set the foundation. When we come to today the account of Joseph, we finally find somebody who seems to be completely devoted to God, completely yielded to God's will, completely accepting God's plan for his life, and completely faithful. He is steady in his moral life, in his ethics, in his uh, good work wherever he finds himself, and he truly is an example. And that's why uh, Joseph is often referred to as a Christ type. So we learn something about Jesus as we look at the life of Joseph. Now, there are other Christ types in the Old Testament, uh, Moses being one, and, and uh, even Abraham and, and Isaac. So as we talked about Abraham, just as a summary, remember that Abraham had a covenant with God, or rather God had a covenant with Abraham, and it was an unconditional covenant, which means that it was all on God. God was going to accomplish his purpose through Abraham. Abraham would occasionally go right or left or up or down, and, and uh, in fact, we could perhaps look at Abraham's faith in God's promise that through his son, there was going to be many, many nations. Um, and that just didn't happen year after year, decade after decade, didn't happen. So maybe he thought it was going to happen through Lot, so he brought Lot with him. Uh, maybe he thought it was going to happen through his uh, servant, Eleazar. That was not going to happen. Maybe he thought, I should have a kid with some other woman besides Sarah, who's obviously barren. That's not going to happen. And so um, um, that didn't work out. And finally, finally, he has the son Isaac. Surprisingly little, little is said about Isaac um, immediately after his birth. You would think after all these years and years of waiting for this 
biological son between, between Sarah and Abraham, that there would be a couple of chapters about Isaac's birth and, and who Isaac was, but it's really rather brief, as we uh, talked about last week in the uh, sacrifice of Isaac or the willingness of Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. We see um, a few chapters about Isaac, and then we see um, some accounts of Jacob. We're not going to talk about Jacob very much. There's quite a bit about Jacob. Jacob, rather like uh, Abraham, his grandfather, knew that God had appointed him and had favored him from the um, birthright, from his uh, fool and his dad to get a blessing. And these things were unnecessary because God had already chosen Jacob over Esau uh, to be the conduit for God's blessing. Again, all of God's work. So Jacob may have known that and kind of like Grandpa Abraham decided that he was going to get things done. And so what we see as uh, what is often labeled as trickery or, or being a con man or being manipulative, pretty good argument for that, may just be the same thing that Abraham was doing. I know what God's purpose is. I know God had blessed me. I know God's going to work through me. So um, I'm just going to help him out and I'll do it this way, that way, that way. But that wasn't God's way. So uh, the one thing that Jacob did was give birth to the 12 tribes. And uh, we see uh, Joseph, who comes along in uh, Jacob's old age, and Jacob tragically, obviously favors uh, Joseph. And I'm not sure Joseph, at the age of 15, 16, 17, when we're introduced to him in the scripture, could really understand what it meant to the other brothers to be such a favored guy in the family. Um, often the youngest, the littlest is, or the oldest is. Um, and so it really spoiled things with the brothers, as, as we know. And Joseph famously had the coat of many colors. Uh, he was uh, lured off with his brothers and thrown in a pit with the intent that they were going to kill him. And instead, they decided they could make a few money, a little bit of money by selling him to uh, some passing slave traders and then uh, put some animal blood on some of uh, Joseph's clothes, probably this multicolored robe that uh, Jacob had uh, provided, which caused so much jealousy, and gave that to Jacob. So Jacob spent most of the rest of his days, uh, 20, 30 years, in belief and in grief that his youngest was dead and the brothers were keeping this conspiratorial secret all this time allowing their father to go through this grieving process but not admitting that they'd made a few bucks off of selling uh, Joseph. So the thing that we learn, well, the things that we learn from uh, Joseph and I'll just give you the, um, the, the list is that uh, Joseph has a life that he really didn't want. He would not have chosen to have been treated that way. He would not have chosen to be basically lured into another land. He would not have chosen to go through the experiences that he went through. And we see in Joseph's life, like Joseph's life hills and valley, he was a favored son, sold into slavery, became the head servant in a uh, prestigious household, was accused of uh, sexual assault, was sent to prison, was elevated in prison to a management and privilege position, and then was forgotten after he had the hope that he might be uh, remembered by the person that he did a great favor to by interpreting a dream, and he was eventually released, the person who had the dream. And then he was remembered and he was able to uh, interpret a dream by God's leading for uh, Pharaoh and became vice president of Egypt. So it was definitely an up and down ride. We see in the names that he gave his children, if you want to look that up, uh, it's very interesting. You can see a little bit of anguish that uh, Joseph is not living the life that he would have chosen to live. 
Yet wherever he was at every stage, he was faithful and he was honest. In the early days of his um, bragging about, or truth-telling, I should say, about the prophecies that he had, which indicated that his brothers would someday bow down to him, um, that was just telling the truth. He didn't seem to understand the diplomatic implications of saying that to his brothers and perhaps could have expressed that differently, but, but he was 17 and probably coddled uh, by Jacob, his father. So as we look into the life of Joseph, and we move from, let me look here real quickly, from uh, the sacrifice of Isaac in uh, chapter 22, uh, Sarah dies in chapter 23, uh, Isaac gets a wife in chapter 24, and that was an interesting story. Uh, Abraham, a little bit of summary about his remaining activities after Sarah died, um, an affirmation of the promise uh, to Isaac through Isaac in chapter 26, and uh, let's see, then you have in chapter 27, that's when the blessing is stolen from Isaac by Jacob, and I say it was stolen, it was already there, so um, it, it, it wasn't what Isaac necessarily wanted because he really loved Isaac. Um, Esau, but um, anyway, Jacob appears to be very deceptive there, he and his mother. Uh, Jacob leaves, meets Rachel, gets married, and he gets deceived by Laban, so a little bit of um, kind of revenge uh, in his life there about his own deceptiveness, and then... Um, Shows him getting rich and having many sons uh, and going on his way from Laban, his father-in-law's household. He makes up with his uh, brother Esau and then we uh, hear a little bit about Esau's family in 36. There's quite a bit of soap opera stuff that goes on in between those chapters. And then we come to chapter 37 as we near the end of the book, and uh, we see Joseph introduced. Joseph had a dream, and he was probably about 17. That's what scholars tell me. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered round it and bowed down to my sheaf. Are you really going to reign over us, his brother asked him? Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, I had another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him because now dad was involved in this symbolism. What kind of dream is this that you've had? He said, am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? Well, the answer to that is yes, here in a few decades. His brothers were jealous of him, but, he kept his, but his father kept the matter in mind. Joseph was then sold into slavery. As we recall, there's a little soap opera interlude between Judah and Tamar in chapter 38. Then we go to chapter 39, and we see Joseph sold into slavery, and this is where we have evidence of Joseph's very consistent faithfulness to do well whatever God gave him to do. Whatever your hands find to do, do it as unto the Lord. And so this is exactly what um, Joseph did. So he was a great servant, became a, uh, a leader in Potiphar's house, and he also apparently was a good-looking man, probably a muscular young guy, and uh, he was around all day uh, around Potiphar's missus, and Potiphar wasn't. So the missus uh, decided that maybe he could, she could uh, mess around a little bit uh, with Joseph, and nobody would be the wiser, and certainly Joseph would say, sure, that's fine with me. Who's going to find out? Um, but Joseph didn't, 
And as we know, Potiphar's wife, uh, as Joseph fled from that temptation, grabbed his cloak. And when Potiphar got home, uh, she made up this story because she'd been spurned. And she said, look, uh, I, was, I managed to fight Joseph off. Potiphar said, all right, you go to prison. Uh, Joseph is in prison. And uh, we look at chapter 40, verse 1. After this, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guards in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guards assigned Joseph to them as their personal attendant, and they were in custody for some time. Uh, they both had dreams. Joseph interpreted for the one, it means you're going to be restored to the king's service, and for the other, he said, um, no, for the baker, you're going to be executed. And uh, that was accurate. So the cupbearer goes back into uh, Pharaoh's service with the promise that he will tell Pharaoh about this cool guy named Joseph who could be uh, smart and a great manager and uh, had some apparent psychic powers and completely forgot about that until... Uh, after two years, Pharaoh has a dream, and he makes a big fuss about it to everybody and basically says, um, interpret my dream. And the uh, psychics in the court said, okay, well, tell us. And Pharaoh said, no, you tell me what my dream was and then tell me what it means. And if you don't, you need to die. Um, sounds very much like the story of Daniel, doesn't it? So um, Pharaoh found out, uh, uh, the uh, cupbearer said, I, I know a guy. And so Joseph comes back into the court and, of course, um, gives the interpretation of the dream, which means you're going to have seven years of really abundant crops, and then after that, seven years of desperate um, famine. And that's exactly what happened. Joseph was... Uh, put in charge of that whole operation to prepare for the disaster to come, uh, kind of the early uh, FEMA of the ancient age. And then we uh, get to the point where Joseph's 17-year-old dream begins to come true as his siblings come into Egypt seeking food because in their land, they were uh, experiencing a severe drought and famine. So we know, as this story continues, that um, the family is eventually told by Joseph. Joseph revealed himself. Uh, the family was quite, the, the siblings were quite concerned that, that uh, Joseph was going to take revenge, but Joseph made this very famous statement, a precursor of uh, Romans 8, 28. He said, look, what you intended for evil, God has used for good. And so he was able to save his family from famine and put them in a, a good and healthy and prosperous place within Egypt. Now, we know that generations later, Pharaohs come and go, and somebody got into office that didn't know why we were taking care of all of these Hebrews, and uh, said, we, we need to enslave them because they're getting too powerful on their own, and then we begin this period of enslavement, which leads us to the book of Exodus, which will be the focus of a new study.